Hi, my name is David Wetton, and welcome to the Conscious Leadership Now podcast. The intent of this podcast is to encourage you as a leader to embrace conscious leadership by giving you access to some of the world's leaders in the field of conscious leadership, both in practice and in thought. My heartfelt wish is that you leave this podcast feeling inspired with ideas to take away and implement in your business or organization to make a real difference in our world. And my guest today is Christine Brown Quinn. Hi, David. Thank you for having me. Hi, Christine. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, following a 30 plus year career in the corporate world, Christine embarked on a new career in 2010 as the female capitalist to share with professional women globally practical hands on business strategies for career progression and work life balance. As she says, the stuff they don't teach you in business school. And she's on a mission to bust the myth that a rewarding career and a fulfilling personal life have to be at loggerheads. So through her webinars, her one-on-one coaching and impersonal workshops, Christine unveils what really matters in getting ahead in demanding corporate environments. And as a former managing director in international finance, Christine is well versed in what it takes to forge a thriving career in a highly pressurized alpha environment. Christine has an MBA in international business from George Washington University. And as a true believer in giving back, one sign of conscious leadership for me, Christine is an executive committee member on George Washington's University Alumni Association and also a member of the Dean's Diversity Council as well. Now, Christine's leadership is grounded in the principles of integrity, diversity, inclusion and courageous conversations, principles which I truly resonate with. And she also serves as a mentor for International Women's Forum Fellows Programme, designed to accelerate the careers of top performing women through world-class leadership and mentoring from executive women leaders. And in March 2020, Christine launched her second book, Unlock Your Career Success, Knowing the Unwritten Rules Changes Everything a book for sharing her insights of success to inspire, motivate, and support other women to be and do likewise. So Christine, I'm really looking forward to having a conscious leadership discussion centering on the contribution of women in world-class leadership, and it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you very much. That was, of course, Take 5 by the Day Brubeck Quartet, and it's my cue that it's time for you, Christine, to take five, your take on five conscious leadership questions. So my first question is, what does conscious leadership mean to you? Conscious leadership for me is about having a purpose in leading. So so thinking about, you know, what is the what is the impact that I want to have? And in any organization, you might have, you know, products, but they're not the purpose. And, mm-hmm. and profit, actually, that's not the purpose uh, either. Um, the, the, the products are a medium for fulfilling that, that, um, that purpose. And one of the things that I find um, most of my client, uh, clients are female is that this really resonates with them in terms of, oh, if it's about me and if it's about me telling how great I am, whatever, so many of my clients are uncomfortable in that type of leadership. When I point out though, however, hey, what would it mean for you to step up to that position? What impact could you have? What difference could you make? And then getting them to think about, hmm, and if I don't do that, you know, who loses? Everybody loses. So I, I do think it's 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 around that that um, that impact or or you know positive outcome. Thank you. I, I love that, and and really purpose is something that comes up so I think very strongly in conscious leadership, and really a purpose. I think, as you said, for the for the greater good of all, and I guess something that perhaps particularly you know women leaders can can really understand and get behind. I'm guessing. Exactly. Exactly. And if I think about. Uh, You know, if I think about my own business, when I was setting up, um, for me, most of my career, as you as you kindly articulated, was in banking, which Mm -hmm. I absolutely love, love the environment, worked mostly in London, international, worked around really, you know, smart people. Um, And then when I felt I had a calling after having, you know, for, for me, you know, getting to managing director, being part of an exec committee, 
um, for a large bank. I then um, was exposed to a launch of a women's network where they asked me to give a talk. I'm like, what's, you know, what's a women's network? And, um, and you know, I was, I had, my head was in the sand. You know, I didn't realize that there were so few, uh, you know, so few females. And so when I did this talk at the launch of this network, I really felt a calling, like this is what I need to be doing, sharing with women that also that leadership, it doesn't mean working harder, working longer. It, and, and that's kind of a, that's a myth. And I want to, and, and I really do want to encourage women to, to think about leading and not, you know, working more time. I mean, you don't have more time, um, but everybody loses when we don't have that, that diverse leadership. So when I was setting up my business, I thought, you know, what does my company do? You know, I don't, you know, the, the, I'm not about one-on-one -on -one coaching and delivering webinars and writing books. I'm about helping women really feel engaged in what they do and feel like they have make a difference and and kind of a byproduct which i hadn't really expected is when they feel engaged at work their whole life feels better you know they're they're better life partners they're better mothers and daughters and parts of the community and that's you know for me that's the purpose if i can make people feel happier and more fulfilled and engaged and, and that personal growth i'm extremely happy I love that. And, and a couple of really key points there, I think. I love the aspect of of, of the calling. I actually felt there was a calling. I'll come back to that in a second. And I also love the aspect, and we know that's so important, the aspect of really feeling, feeling engaged in your work. Because I think engagement then is really an important part of making a passionate difference to whatever you're doing. So what I wanted to ask you in your conscious leadership journey, because that's a theme that's come up in this podcast, that it is a journey, and you've spoke about what really peaked, what, what, not what peaked is the right word, what really caught your interest or what, how did your calling arise as far as, you know, the female capitalist, as far as supporting and empowering women in leadership? What was, you know, where did, where does that calling come from for you? Um, well, first of all, I, it was, if you had told me when I was in the midst of my corporate career that this is what I would be doing, I would have told you you're absolutely nuts. You know, I, I it was something that I didn't expect. Um, there is a lot of talk today about, oh, you know, am I, am I fulfilled? And, and I think as a person for me, I always did feel in my corporate career, I thought about, oh, I am making a difference. I'm running a profitable group. I'm, you know, I'm helping people, you know, earn a living and all that that brings. I have a team. My team is, you know, my, motivated. I'm helping clients manage their money. Um, the other thing in terms of the conscious leadership piece is I found that as a parent, it really helped me focus on that emotional intelligence piece of leadership, where at home, I realized, for instance, one of the biggest leadership lessons is I realized one day I was at home and my two oldest kids said, hey, mom, you lied. You said you were going to do this and, you know, not to do this and you've done that. And all of a sudden it like hit me in the face. Ah, this is leadership. It's following through with what you say. And I thought, oh, that's what I have to remember when I'm at work. Because when you make those mistakes and not being consistent at work, mm -hmm. you know, the gossip starts and everything else. <laughs> There's not necessarily somebody that will tell you. And with kids, you know, they come right out with, with it. And I think that also having a family for me helped me keep honest, you know, um, honest and down to earth. I'm mm -hmm. no better than anybody else. And, and if I'm this, you know, if I felt very much the leader at home, then at work, I felt a big responsibility on myself. Hey, I got to, I got to, um, you know, live up to that standard. And, and how would I, if I was in a difficult situation, I'd say to myself, how would I expect my kids to behave in this situation? Uh, and that has really kind of helped me, really guided me throughout my career in terms of, of leadership and, and management. And I think the female piece really came about by realizing that, um, you know, I am no superwoman. I have no superpowers. Um, you know, I, I perhaps I have some other qualities. You know, like persistence. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly tenacious. Um, <laughs> but you know, I just felt that there that we were missing um, that diverse thinking in leadership, and and that doesn't happen overnight. So. Um, although I do uh, coach some very senior women and, and men as well, the piece that I'm really focused on is the pipeline. And for that, you know, women in the pipeline, that, that pipeline is incredibly important so that 
uh, so that women are, are making decisions that um, best serve them and best serve the organization. And there, you know, there's a lot of myths out there. So I really wanted to help women in that, in that journey to, to share with them also. It's fun. It's fun. It's exciting. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, for me, it was about having a seat at the table. Becoming managing director wasn't the title. It was, hey, yeah. I want to be part of the conversation. Mm, wonderful and i love the passion coming off this podcast i'm sure the, <laughs> the listeners can also feel it and you've already kind of started it i think but my, my sex, second question is how do you express conscious leadership through your work yeah i, I think it's um it's definitely so especially for the coaching and career various career workshops that i run i actually start with a vision board what you know just put together images that resonate with you personally and professionally um, so that I can start to get a picture of and, and help them mm -hmm. help the individual mm -hmm. clarify what's important to them what are their values because I think where some of um, you know some of today's you know how to you know look in the internet and you can find out how to do anything but the reality is that you know career change especially change Motivation is really key, and and also in terms of long-term sustainable mm -hmm. progress and new ch and and doing things differently, it has to really resonate with you deeply, and that's to your core, and that and that's your value. So for me, it starts there, and also I will talk about okay, if this is your career goals, tell me about your personal goals, and and do they support one another? So for me, they're not they're not separate. That personal mm -hmm. professional piece, it's that whole person. They're not separate. Wonderful. Again, so much. Thank you so much. So much in there. You know, this aspect of, I think, really conscious leadership being there from a holistic perspective. So you're bringing your whole self to the table, as you say, including what's happening in the home side of things. And I really like. I really like the aspect of. I think, asking them. You know, what their values are, what their vision is, because then I think, as you perhaps alluded to, that really means that actually there's something that's tailored to them. And not only tailored to them, I think, you know, I've seen with, with good conscious leaders, people who were with them, they really felt, they really feel listened to and understood. And that's what I feel is happening there when you're asking them to, to bring forth at times what may be vulnerable things, but I believe are really empowering things for people. Absolutely, completely agree. So, and, and it's that, and I think also, I think it's that focus you said before, you know, that focus, I think on, on values too often, well, maybe I shouldn't say too often, that's what I'm going to say, but I think actually the focus on values, I think, as you said, when, when, uh, when we hit hard times, it's really, are we still living our values? How do we manage when times are more difficult? And I think that's where values come in as well. So I'm guessing actually, I want to ask a question because I'm curious here that looking on the female leaders that, that, that you work with, how do, do you know, how do they fall, fall back or how do they rely on the values when they're in these difficult conversations or difficult situations in the workplace? And perhaps let's just push it forward, perhaps in an alpha workplace. How do they use their values to really show up and make a difference for, for them? I think that um, in, in especially in that kind of environment, it's about building alliances. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is something actually I, I learned working in a Japanese bank and the Japanese culture is about mm -hmm. consensus. And so instead of doing the American thing is everybody gets in a meeting and punches it out <laughs> in the Japanese culture, people came to a meeting and they kind of rubber stamp what has already mm -hmm. been agreed. And it's that it's that kind of relation piece. I talk about that in my in my book, Review Relationships. It's thinking about, OK, um, if this is the vision I have as a leader, um, who can I who can I have a conversation with to bring them on side to get them to see also how they fit into the bigger picture? So, so if you think about it in an alpha mm. environment, if you're if you're suggesting something different, you could be shot down just because it's different, right? Yes. Whereas whereas that kind of behind the scenes sharing your vision, helping the individual fit into that, see how they fit into that vision then you can bring people on board. And then in terms of, of you know, decisions that are more um, in line with your values, that, that's the way it happens. It's not gonna happen by, okay, well, let me just have it out. Let me just tell the other person they're wrong. This is not gonna happen. You know, negative, negative, negative. That, that's not gonna work. It just won't work. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. And we spoke beforehand about how I believe, and we'll speak about your book a bit later, but how I believe it in your book, you're really drawing on this aspect of emotional intelligence. As I said before, I love the, the wording you've got about revering relationships. And you speak about, you know, managing your manager, but the relationship as a partnership, as you've just explained. And, and I really love that quality of emotional intelligence that's coming to the table. And I have one further question on this area is that, which I'm sure my listeners are sort of saying, David, ask that question, ask that question. How are the alpha males in the workplace responding to the work that you're doing? Um, well, I do think that there is a lot of um, societal pressure, pressure by investors, pressure by communities, um, you know, it's, it's, it's never been greater than now in terms of, okay, where are the women? Okay, if I'm a consumer, if I'm head of a consumer um, product and 50% or more of my clients are, are female, well, how, how can you possibly understand me? Where, where am I represented on your, on your leadership team? Mm -hmm. There's a lot in the investment, you know, in the investment community. Um, likewise, where it's also coming down to you know, maybe winning, winning a new client, even being invited to a proposal. I mean, I've heard, I've heard stories of companies where they've gone in to um, propose for work, even, even law firms where they've gone in to propose for a piece of work and, um, and they didn't get it because they brought in four people that all look like one another and said, well, how can you possibly represent our business? So I think there's enormous business pressure the other trend that I see is also, um, particularly for, for male leaders, that um, they have young daughters that um, are coming into the workforce, and then it kind of hits them in the face. What do you mean you didn't get that promotion? <laughs> right? Like all of a sudden, they're seeing, they're, they're, they're kind of seeing that, um, that there is a lot of things that are happening that that are not at that conscious level that, that maybe sometimes women are being selected for things and then they, then they have a, a more of a personal stake. Yes, yes, thank you. And, and of course, we, I think we both know, there's, um, you know, I'm passionate about this area and there's a lot of research around diversity and looking at gender inclusion that actually end of the day, as well as making you know, human sense, it makes business financial sense as well. So if that helps and supports, then, then, I, then I'm all for that. I wanted to also jump in there what, as we were talking about mm -hmm. the whole person, because mm -hmm. I think also around the, um, the pandemic, um, I, I see a change. I see a change in what, what investors and the community and you know, consumers expect mm -hmm. from leadership, and they expect humanity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that has been incredibly, you know, incredibly inspiring. Um, to, to see how that language has, has changed from leaders. Yes, that's right. And, and, and I do know that, that in your book, you talk about we live in a new normal. And you were saying that was even before COVID-19 <laughs> came in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that new normal is really around, uh, you know, the technology 24-7, um, you know, organizations working, working virtually, uh, you know, it is, it, it is a, it's a completely, you know, restructurings, as an example, restructurings early on in my career, it was considered an extraordinary expense. And you, you mm. have that on your financial statements. Now, I mean, every sector that I work with is doing restructuring after restructuring after restructuring. And that was, ap and that was even before, as you say, before the current um, pandemic. So the pace of change um, I think is is phenomenal, and therefore, you know, going back to the to the leadership question, um, you know, it's not about leading where you're you're connected to a product. What you're connected to mm. is more of an idea and an outcome and a and a and a purpose, and that's that's long lasting. It certainly is, isn't it? And I guess when we talk about purpose, for me, one thing, a really great purpose, I think, inspires others. So sort of segueing into our next question, the first part of this next question is, who for you is an exemplar of embodied conscious leadership and why? Well, I struggled a bit with this question, if I'm honest. And I think the reason is that I don't necessarily have one leader in my mm. mind. Mm. Uh, what I tend to do is I'll read different biographies, I'll read different TED Talks, and I'll take pieces and I'll say, yep. oh, I, you know, I really like that. Um, one recent one is the uh, CEO of Salesforce, uh, oh, yes. Mark Benioff. And yeah. I, I saw him on a, uh, I think it was the Bloomberg channel. Mm. And um, 
And I was absolutely blown away by his interview. Um, conscious leadership. Well, one, I loved his style, really down to earth. You know, it's not like he's up here and everybody else is, is, is below. Um, and he was citing an example of, um, of Indiana and um, there being an anti, anti-gay law that was being implemented. And he said to the state of Indiana, you know, I'll have to pull out my operations because this, this impacts, you know, my customers or my employees. And, and what I loved about that, what, what, what struck me is it's about consistency, number one. And number two, he's thinking about, you know, all of his stakeholders and, it, and that just didn't work. And I, and I just love that, you know, he, he stood up for, you know, for the principal. Um, you know, it was, it was a matter of principle, which I, which I really liked. Um, given that we've spoken so much about women leadership, um, I have to say that um, from a political standpoint, um, I really do admire Angela Merkel's style, which again is very collaborative, very, very behind the scenes. And, and, and you know, she doesn't make abrupt decisions. It's really about, okay, let me get the data. Um, you know, she's not maybe so much as a charismatic leader, um, but even around the, the um, you know, the pandemic, how quickly, you know, how quickly Germany was able to, to um, uh, implement the lockdown and, and make decisions. And, and, you know, there is some cohesiveness there. Um, so I really do admire that piece. And I think that that, that, you know, it was kind of like what I was saying is what she's doing is she's go, she is obviously building alliances and building support for her decisions. She is, and I think from my limited understanding, obviously, you know, the, the German politics has this consensus basis, so it's to some extent, uh, you know, second nature, but as you said, you know, she's been there for quite a while, so she does it exceptionally well, and and maybe, as you said, through that, that, that's a, that, that is one example of, of who, you know, other leaders can look towards, because I, I have, for my own my own sense, that's the way that we're going, if we're not already there, around this this type of leadership that actually involves you know, the people has more of a consensus basis because I think we felt for a long time, perhaps in the patriarchal, more alpha environment, it's about a heroic leader, someone taking decisions at the front, whereas actually the consensus, the more consensual style leadership is more, for me, conscious leadership, servant leadership, spiritual leadership, has a sense of really making uh, better decisions that have, actually I think have a greater buy-in and a buy-in from the heart, not just from the mind. Yeah, I think it, it's um, it, the conscious leadership is, is about sustainability and long term. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, you know, I'm very much a realist and there are there are situations where, um, you know, the leader has to make a quick decision because it's an emergency. Right. It, yes. it, but yeah. but yeah. in that and that consensus, let's let's be truthful here. It's not easy. Oh, my yeah. gosh. You know, there's difficult conversations and and, you know, understanding different people's needs. It's, it's not a, uh, an easy solution, mm -hmm. but, I, but also I saw this in, um, in business as well, where, um, where for, um, I generally reported to the head of, head of di um, the division as, as COO. And, um, and what I saw is uh, the CEOs that were the heads of the division who, who really got consensus for, okay, so in my world is around maybe um, a strategic decision around markets or products or technology platforms. When the head of division got buy-in across a wider set of people, when that head of division left, those things continued. Yes. Whereas the style, yeah. I also saw a style of leadership where it was just pushed mm. down people's throat. And I was amazed, <laughs> David, like within 24 <laughs> hours, decisions that were, you know, that were, that stood fast for maybe during their tenure, maybe two years, switched on a dime. So, so it, I, I do think there's something about, about legacy and, and sustainability as well. I, th I think you're absolutely right. And, and the, the game changing moment for me, because I think this is an important area around the consensus, is that what I found in my experience is that people actually really want to be heard and understood, not necessarily have their decision or their thoughts taken forward. If they know that actually they've been listened to and understood and their contribution is there on the table, even if it doesn't then move forward, there's a sense of actually I've been included in this process and I know I'm not, you know, my views have been heard at the table. I think when people aren't being heard, that's when I think, you know, as you said, and I've seen it myself in big corporate business where, as you said, you know, typically a CEO leaves and then suddenly everything changes. 
and the decisions yeah, yeah. he it's normally was he in my case he had made suddenly get switched and changed and as you said there was no real sustainability around that yeah precisely yeah now you mentioned you already mentioned i think you mentioned ted talks and the second part of this question is in this journey i'll come back to consciousness journeys what resources have you found useful well, I, um, I have to say that I don't subscribe to um, many other people's stuff, you know, <laughs> blogs and things, but um, one leadership coach that I have found really resonates with me is a guy called Scott Evelyn. He's, he's American mm -hmm. and I connected um, to him through, um, through one of my universities and he has written um, uh, at least two books, one called Overworked and Overwhelmed and one called The Next Level. Um, and the Overworked and Overwhelmed, it just resonated with me because it was all about how um, as a leader, if I'm not taking care of myself, mm. um, you know, spiritually, physically, uh, mentally, and he has a fourth car car uh, category called relationally, oh, relation, you know, so it's mm. about relations. If I'm not taking care of myself on those four dimensions, then mm. I'm not going to be a good leader. So it's kind of like the oxygen mask on the airplane. I need that first before I help other people. And, uh, and he talks about how, you know, so many leaders that he's worked with over the years who, when they weren't, you know, well on those four categories, they couldn't make decisions. They didn't have patience. You know, consensus building takes patience. Yes. Emotional intelligence, exercising emotional intelligence require, you know, that that's part of having patience. So, so, um, and he also has a corporate background. So for me, it's that blend of, I, I, I resonate, um, I really like his messages. Plus he's, you know, again, he's a realist. So he, so there's a couple blogs and, and books. Um, he's really my, um, the, only, the few people that I, uh, that I um, follow on a regular basis. And as I was saying earlier, most of the other, um, uh, you know, TED Talks and books are really, um, I'll, I'll just, you know, kind of come across, um, if I mention a few, um, Alex Ferguson, um, oh, I'm a Liverpool is. supporter, but um, Alex <laughs> oh, Ferguson, I love, the, I love the longevity of his leadership and also how he went through, he managed a team through change where it was a very domestic sport and how he upgraded that and, mm. and how he did that and how he brought people along really impressed with that. Um, another, another leadership book that I found inspiring was the founder of Nike, um, Bill Knight. And of course now he has a whole Knight, Knight foundation. So, so there isn't one particular, but as I said, what I really like about it is, is, um, you know, I'll read something and it will spark an idea and I'll say, ah, oh, that's how I can use it in my own work and kind of rephrase it or whatever. No, that's wonderful. I really like that, that, that aspect of, um, you know, there's an idea and an idea sparks in you, you know, and, and I know that, that for myself as well. So I really like that. And you touched on it briefly about the, um, you talked about the four elements, which again, I really loved, you know, the, the, um, the what I call the physical, the, uh, uh, you know, the mental, the, uh, in, in, um, sorry, the emotional and then the spiritual side. So on the spiritual side, um, my next question is research suggests, and it's researched by Professor Jody Fry at Texas A&M University, that an inner life is the source of conscious leadership, where inner life is a form of spiritual or contemplative practice, could also just be a reflective practice, which could include walking in nature as well as meditation and yoga and a member of other things. What uh, practices have you found helpful in your journey and why? Well, one of the things that I would say is just kind of setting the context is we are we're just bombarded by kind of stimuli for the fight and flight you know messages and um you know chats and your phone beeping and and you know email mm -hmm. um and uh and then in, a, in an office in-person office uh <laughs> situation if we can remember back then um you know again people are coming in and out and i think as a leader you have to be really careful because you're you're getting bombarded and you're you're with all the stimuli and you're reacting and you're not and you're not thinking. So I think mm -hmm. the reason why your question is so important is because we need time for our brain to relax, kind of rest and digest, to be able to work out trickier issues, to think strategically, to think about, you know, to think about that, you know, that purpose and um, for me, um, I was looking at your, um, the Center for Compl 
a contemplative mind in, in society, your, your tree. And for me, the movement really resonated with me. I've always been, um, in my younger days, I was a runner as, mm. as, uh, at, at um, school and university. I, I did all kinds of sports. Um, now, I, my go-to sport is cycling. Uh -huh. And for me, I mean, and now with this and the pandemic, I have cycled virtually every single day. And it has been, it, it has really been a godsend and with the beautiful weather. You know, it just, for me, it's also my brain. I do have some of my best ideas cycling. <laughs> um, you know, especially when I'm working on something. So say it's a new webinar or I'm writing an yeah. article or whatever, yes. you know, kind yes. of kind of letting those those different pieces of ideas um, connect and 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 there is something that for me it's just it calms me so that mm. that's how I kind of set myself so for me it's not I know when I, I so I cycle in the morning first thing that that's going to set me you know for you know for the day mm, thank you and and, and I, I agree with you on that as, as you as we spoke earlier I also enjoy cycling and and thank you for framing the question that way of kind of almost like bring some stillness bring some awareness to what's going on as well as you said when you're out or doing that this this thing your ideas can come to you you can get a sense of being connected with whatever that greater thing might be for yourself i just want to ask you something on this because as you know i'm a curious person and <laughs> you spoke about stilling and being ready for things so again i've just picked something from your book because i really love what it what it said in here and also the alliteration you speak about cherishing challenging conversations and I saw my listeners going, what do you mean, cherishing, challenging conversation? So I got a sense as you were speaking there that, that that can feed into that. So I just quickly wanted to ask you, what, and actually you called it a pathway of growth. So what do you mean yeah. about that? <laughs> challenging conversations at work. Oh, my God, those are so hard. What do you mean? <laughs> I built a career on challenging <laughs> conversations. Seriously. Uh. If there was one thing that, you know, in terms of my brand, um, and it, it, this is how it happened. So when I was hired by, um, by the uh, London-based bank, uh, finishing my MBA, um, my, uh, my hubby decided he would leave his job. He would sort mm -hmm. something out. So he was definitely you know, following me. We had two young kids. I joined this bank. And one of the first things I had to do is work with a salesperson. I was in charge of a product area. And the salesperson, you know, the idea was the salespeople were going to open up their accounts to my product. And the more products that a customer did with, with the bank, the, the, you know, the, the, the longer um, the client would stay with the bank, you know, that sort of thinking. But here I am a couple months in the job and clash with this, with this salesperson. And I just felt that this person did not respect me. He treated me like I didn't know what finance was. I didn't know what bonds were. Like if I st was standing at the in front of traders, like what are you doing here? Like I didn't need to know oh. where things traded. I and mean, it was awful. Mm. So I decided, hey, it's like being on the playground. I'm not going to go tell the teacher. I'm not going to tell my boss. I, you know, there's an issue. I got to deal with this because I got a lot on the line. I've just moved my entire family from the mm. U.S. Um, so so I thought about it and I thought. Um, Okay, I'm going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. First of all, I'm going to give him heads up and say, hey, you know, um, really like to have a conversation off the training floor. You know, how about Tuesday at, you know, 4.30? So I picked the day where I was at my best, where the markets were closed, one-on-one -on -one private setting. Mm. So set this up. And before we even have a conversation, it gets around the training floor that I want to have a one-on-one -on -one with, with Earl. And, and it's like, well, what does Christine <laughs> want to talk to me about? So it was very interesting because I had the courage to yes. even set this meeting up. It's like all of a sudden, mm. like what, what's going on? So that felt, that made me feel better. I mean, I was shaking in my boots. I was so, oh, I didn't sleep for nights. <laughs> um, so anyway, the day comes, Tuesday, 4.30 comes. And I, you know, obviously I thought about this, didn't pre-script it, but what were the key things? The key thing was how I felt mm. and what, what, the, what the outcome was that I was looking for. So I told him, you know, I feel like you treat me like I'm a stupid son of a gun. You know, I don't even know what a bond is. Um, and I really, I think it's important for us to work together because it's good for your clients. It's good for my client, you know, to, for your client to trade my product. It's good for our bank. You know, it's a win-win. So, um, so he was absolutely shocked. He had no idea he was coming across that way. 
um, low emotional intelligence at the time. Um, and, and the thing is, I, after that, and also I told no one, I never told my boss, I never told anybody else on the trading floor. And, and what happened then was I developed a reputation. Like if you're going to have, you know, if you're going to mess around with Christine or whatever, if something happens, you can be assured that she's going to talk to you. <laughs> she's not going to run away. And then I would then gradually over the years, then people would even come to me to say, Ooh, Christine, do you think you could have a conversation with so-and-so? <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I mean. And so what was really funny in this alpha environment where most people were bigger, <laughs> louder voices, bigger physically, they didn't have the courage that I had mm. to confront the conflict. And what I found was though, kind of like my story there with Earl, it took the relationship to another level. Yes. We mm. went on to do great business together. Mm. He was, he mm. became a great fan of mine. And, and also in your personal relationship, it's those difficult conversations. Mm. They're the ones we need to be having absolutely almost like i want to take a breath there what a, what a great <laughs> what a great story i really you know that's a real nugget i really appreciate that and i just want to honor your your courage because i really feel it you know i get that and i do get that sense and when you said he didn't realize i can almost kind of reflect that to you being a male and i've worked in some big workplaces you know sometimes it's not seen but actually it does need in my sense to be brought to the attention of and that's part of my role but to actually do that you said with the courage and i felt that kind of transformation and the impact had not just on him in his comes in but as you said on the trading floor and the the wider organization you know i can see why people come and get coached with you christine <laughs> <laughs> and you know and on the on the coaching thing the other yeah. the, the thing that um when you were talking about the thinking time and the spiritual mm. time the other thing that I find linking that back to coaching is that I find with my clients is that it gives them space to think. They're so go, go. They're so delivery focused yes. that spending time and saying, okay, well, hold on a second. What's the impact that you want to have? Okay. How are you spending your time? Right. Who are the people you really should be spending your time with? Yes. Right. What are the conversations you really should be having? So I think that's the, in a way that coaching time is almost that, that, that scheduled reflection time as well. It is. Isn't it? And, and thank you. I mean, I love that. And just to, to just, just kind of coming to me, I love the aspect of kind of approaching that conversation, both in a heartfelt way. So it was a vulnerable way as to what was coming up for you and sharing that. And also, as you said, addressing it from a win-win situation kind of sense is important for the business, the client, a bigger thing. Great. You have wonderful emotional intelligence around that. Thank you. So my, my final question, if you might, I'm going to actually couch in the terms of um, conscious um, women leaders if, if, or female leaders, that's okay. So the final question is, given unlimited time and resources, what single thing would you recommend aspiring conscious female leaders to do? Um, I think it's back to this time element. Make time mm -hmm. to just think. Um, I think also on a culture standpoint, it's like, oh, well, my, I'm so important because my diary is, is, you know, back to back. I'm in back to back mm. meetings, you know, and just going from meeting to meeting. Well, where's your reflection time? What did you want to mm. get out of that meeting? You know, yeah. what's the outcome that you were looking for? Um, so I think that that, that's incredibly important, that thinking time. Um, and that means of course, that you have to, you're going to have to delegate, you know, you're as a leader your um you know your importance shouldn't be it's 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 a it's a question of what your the influence that you're having not the you're, you're in back-to-back -back meetings right so having that that reflection time i think is so important to make sure as i was saying to prioritize things in the right way and to think strategically thinking mm -hmm. strategically and i think that's so key and 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 going back to the pandemic this is kind of one of my themes in the last two months with my clients is to say okay, the world again is being disrupted. Um, it was crazy before, now it's really crazy. That also means there must be opportunities emerging. And if you're just running, running, tactical, mm. tactical, you're not gonna be able to see those opportunities. So I think for a leader, it's about taking time to just think um, and, and you know, where, where are those opportunities and, and linking into that, that impact and influence you wanna have. Mm, thank you. And, and you are correct. I think, I think, you know, some people are calling this coronavirus, you know, the coronavirus moment, you know, the big pause, which does tally into, well, I do have time to 
to maybe think, you know, and that word pivot or what am I going to do? So to maybe there's almost the culture of the times we find ourselves in lend it to, you know, taking time and reflecting and, and perhaps even just thinking about how do I want to show up? What difference do I want to make in the world? Going back to what we've said before, the purpose and values. So uh, I think that's wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Now, and, and as those who listen to this podcast know, actually, I, I love watching Columbo. And one of the things he has, he has always has just one more thing question. So I have my just one more thing question. And it's this. Um, you've spoke, we've, we've already spoken. I want to hear more, a little bit more about your book, Unlock Your Career Success, Knowing the Unwritten Rules Change Everything. But please share some of your own resources, your books, your offerings, which you feel will be helpful to those listening and watching this podcast, please. Thank you very much. Um, I would say definitely um, the book, uh, which is a new release, Unlock Your Career Success, Knowing the Unwritten Rules Changes Everything. Those unwritten rules, it's all the, um, the non-technical things about being successful in a career and, and certainly a, as a leader. They're all around the emotional intelligence. And um, this, these are the, um, you know, I say unwritten rules because also I found um, that that for me, going into the workforce, I, I had to learn these things and I was observant and I watched behavior. But what when I first entered the workforce, I thought it was all about doing a good job. And then as you realize the more senior you become doing a good job, you need, you need other people. Mm -hmm. You need, my rule number one is owning your career. You're the one that has to drive it. What is, you know, what is it that you're looking to achieve? What is the direction that you want to go? Not waiting for your, you know, your manager, somebody or head of HR, right? It's, it, it, it's you. So I definitely would recommend um, my book. And the other thing um, as an offering, it just in terms of having a career chat and, and maybe, um, you know, helping your, your um, you know, listeners think about things a little differently and where they really want to go, um, through my website, if you want to contact me for a 30 minute, um, career chat, you know, happy, happy to have a conversation as well. That's wonderful. Thank you. And, and, uh, listeners, viewers will find links to that in, in, in the, uh, description below. So they'll be able to contact you. Um, and I just want to say, Chris, Christine, just thank you so much for, for being on the, uh, on the podcast and really showing up in the world of conscious leadership in the way that you do. I've really enjoyed our conversation and the, really the passion and enthusiasm you bring to this particular area. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. And I want to say to those of you that are listening, that if you've enjoyed this podcast and my approach to conscious leadership, then please know that I help aspiring conscious leaders develop purpose-led, high-performing leadership teams through one-to-one -one coaching and tailored leadership programs. If you sense I can help you, then please look me, look me up, David Wetton on LinkedIn, and let's jump onto a conversation together. And finally, I want to thank all the listeners to this podcast, if you're willing, please do share a link to this podcast and to those you think would truly benefit from it. Because I truly believe that now is the time for conscious leadership. And with all the inspiring, heartfelt work you as listeners are doing, I have no doubt that conscious leadership will become a thriving reality, making a difference for the greater good of all. So until next time, I'll leave you with a blessing from John O'Donoghue. May the light of your soul bless the work you do with the secret love and warmth of your heart. And so it is. <laughs>